Carl Walter Lindenlaub, cinematographer for Halo, new series on Paramount. Plus, obviously, the show draws heavily from the expansive mythology of the video games. It doesn't directly adapt any specific story. But from a visual perspective, I wanted to ask you, like, how did you guys go about making sure you were, you know, hitting the beats of what fans of the video game would expect while also making it its own thing? I think we, from the get-go, we tried to strike a balance between the action scenes, which, you know, were feeding into the expectations of all the video gamers, and uh, our ambition to tell a, a more deeply uh, drawn out story that, that lies, relies heavily on, on the character development of our heroes, you know, and, and their interactions. Uh, I got to say, I mean, what drew, what drew me to this series was not shooting endless action. I'm not a video gamer myself. <laughs> My son played the game and he actually helped me get the job and I had to write a concept. But uh, I was actually interested uh, in the show because the two scripts that were sent to me in the beginning were telling a very interesting, unexpected uh, story about somebody trying to find his humanity you know, in the future being genetically altered or being, being at least uh, enhanced <clears throat> enhanced as a fighter and, and then uh, finding this chip and, and, and being uh, and trying to find his, his history and his past. You, know? you, you mentioned that. I love that uh, for, for Master Chief. That's the main character. You have like in, a, a lot of like, I would say like ephemeral or like, uh, you know, flashbacks to his, you know, before his early days. How did you guys talk about how, you know, how did you decide that's how you wanted that to look and, and feel? Because I, I found that choice like really interesting. Like you said, it's not, just all relentless action, you have these like nice new character beats and stuff. So how did you decide on how that would look? I mean, the whole Halo universe has a lot of variety and we had an enormous amount of different sets and different worlds to figure out. Um, and to ground all this, I decided to shoot the, the main part of the show on, on uh, very uh, modern lenses, signature primes. Uh, but then the flashbacks lend itself to do something a little different. Uh, I had a very long lasting relationship with uh, Manfred Jahn in Munich at, at the Airy rental house. And just like here, Panavision in America, they can make um, custom stuff for you if you need something special. And uh, Manfred, uh, like I said, has been su supporting me for many years in European projects. So I asked him, do you have some lenses that give me a different look? Uh, detuned lenses are very much in fashion. So <laughs> he sent me uh, a whole set of, of DNA lenses uh, with different levels of, of detuning. So uh, we had kept those for the whole show, really, and, and shot the flashbacks on it. And in addition to it, we added some shifted sets where we could throw certain areas of the image out of focus. Uh, all of that helped to capture something that looked different than the rest of the show. And then we did a lot in post. <laughs> it was a yeah. whole group discussion. I mean, in the television world, uh, the producers have a lot to say. The, the showrunner comes into play. Uh, I'm more used to feature films where it's one director and one vision. In this case, there's a there's an exchange of ideas. And, and I think the, the common uh, consensus was to, to have the flashbacks start very uh, desaturated and almost overexposed. Uh, we defocus the edges even more to make it more uniform. Uh, and then the longer the story progresses, the more Master Chief uh, retains his memory, the more this comes back to reality and, and, and gets more saturated and real. Yeah, you mentioned before you, you're not necessarily a gamer, but your son helped you with like the uh, the concept and the memory. I guess, what was that like? What was your pitch basically for this? Like, is that like kind of what you were talking about there? Or like overall, like what was your your pitch for it? For the flashbacks? No, just for the show in general, like how you, how you wanted to look and stuff. Like what were those, what was your initial kind of idea? Well, my initial idea was uh, to use the LF, the, the large format camera. I th uh, they had just become more, more uh, used and, uh, and more available. Uh, I thought that was a great way to go for a big franchise that probably is gonna live on for many years and needed, uh, needed a, a, a big canvas, you know? Uh, and I really liked the idea that you could be intimate in the larger format with actors uh, where the background gets uh, more uh, thrown out of focus and at the same time be able to capture big big sets and, and big environments without much lens distortion you know the, that's the advantage of shooting on a larger format mm -hmm. um, it's just like in still photography the 
the larger the format, the longer the lenses, the less distortion. Right. That's, that's when you when you, you've obviously done like like a lot of you mentioned like feature films, you've done a lot of stuff that has incredible visual effects, like Independence Day and Stargate. I know and like yeah. Chronicles of Narnia. This show, I think the effects are incredible as well. It's so it, the show feels like incredible. It's just massive in scope. How do you manage? I guess how do you balance like the visual effects with like getting those character moments and making sure it all feels like organic to the world? I think there's one key to shooting big action scenes for me is always never forget your protagonists, you know, stay close to them, uh, try and try and make it personal. Uh, action scenes become very technical and you have an enormous amount of shots to, to, to figure out how to do. Uh, way too many cameras shooting, <laughs> a lot of stuff going on. Uh, but as an audience, I think the danger is that you get over stimulated with imagery as, and, and you know everything has been done the marvel universe rules the world <laughs> we've all seen these endless action scenes and i think it's really important that you that you stay with the person you know and we figured out certain shots with otto in the beginning the, the director of the first two episodes and the producer uh, that worked really well we had for example a close-up on a 57 uh, which is a funny focal length but let's say a 50 uh, 57 large format lens that felt like you're really with the person without being intrusive and at the same time being very intimate and not being far away on a telephoto lens so those kind of shots worked really well on on, on our lead actors we used that a lot during the whole show sort of like a medium close-up here that's really with the but the camera is maybe five feet away, four feet away in that personal space, but not too close. Uh, and then we had to figure out some shots, how we get into this first person shooter POV. Some of those had to be done, you know, of course you don't do a whole movie like that, but in certain action sequences, you had to do that, you know, because of such a signature thing in all these video games. Uh, and uh, for that, we had an interesting transition. Uh, we did some shots where we moved really quickly towards uh, Pablo and towards Master Chief. Uh, I even ha had a special close focus lens uh, sent that we could really go really close as we come to the helmet. And then the, with visual effects help, uh, the camera seamlessly moves into the helmet and then sees the POV. And for that, we had a helmet camera rig I had a young uh, Hungarian uh, female DP who had just finished film school. She was assisting me through the whole show. Without her, I could have never done all the prep and all these things. And she was very fit with all the little cameras. So she tested all these little, little uh, off the shelf cameras. And we ended up with a black magic uh, that wasn't so small, but <laughs> small enough and, and, and good enough for visual effects to do compositing, you know? Yeah. Well, that, yeah. That was mounted on a helmet that the stunt, stunt actor was carrying. So you, the great thing about that perspective is you can have the arms and if you want a rifle in the shot and that puts you right in there. You know? Yeah. You, it's, it's really a remarkable fact. And like, I like, like you said, like it doesn't, it doesn't overdo it. I don't think the show. So like you kind of pick and choose your spots with that. The first person aspect of it. Yeah. Do you, another and not to go like wasn't it cool this shot you mentioned that in the pilot episode right before there's the opens with this relentless relentless battle excuse me and there's a shot right before like all the carnage kind of starts where the camera uh kwan sees like the alien ship and then you kind of swoop down uh like basically race into her and she's yeah. like running away and her friends are about to get massacred it's it's an incredible shot i was like and like you said every marvel has done everything but i still was surprised by the way that looked and like that whole thing played out I, can you talk about setting that up because it's really cool yeah that was very ambitious day one <laughs> that's the only time all the studio executives actually made it to hungary they were all there wanting to see how halo finally gets off the ground you know for 15 years people had been trying to make a feature out of it and then make a tv series out of it whatever so here we are <laughs> day one we're in this in this uh, sort of forest uh, rocky area uh, and uh, the idea was to have the camera fly through the forest find the the young kids that are there on a on a little expedition where they all get high on some mushrooms uh, so the camera swoops down and then moves around them in a half circle. And as the camera moves around them, mayhem ensues and, and you know, one of the kids explodes. And it, it, was, it was an amazing contrast between, you know, this happy uh, uh, pubescent uh, youth and then suddenly war happens, you know, aliens attack and it's brutal, uh, which is kind of what, what 
the, the story is, you know, there's there's very personal, intimate stuff, but then there's also um, humanity is at stake. <laughs> and, you know, it, it actually feels much different now with the war in Ukraine, I gotta say, it has a different different feeling. Anyway, that shot technically, we first tried a big cable cam system that, that didn't quite function well. And then thank God with Tom Struthers, our second unit director and stunt coordinator, uh, he helped a lot, He's, he knows a lot about rigging. Uh, and with our Italian key group, Tommaso Mele, who had got the Ronin cable rig that we could use the Ronin stabilized head. And we built our own cable rig for that shot, you know, that tested all day. I came in the evening, we did our first test run because the next morning we were supposed to shoot this. <laughs> there was like, oh, yeah. there was really no room for error anymore. No. <laughs> so, it, so the camera flies on the Ronin and then the A operator unhooks it. It's, it's connected with a magnet and a hook. The magnet releases the hook and then you can unhook the, the system and run with it around the actors it's a it's a fun thing where a lot of people have to co work together as a team yeah <laughs> yeah it, it's an incredible shot and, and it's a great show carl walter lynn love we have to wrap up here but thank you so much halo yeah. all episodes is, are streaming on paramount plus thank you so much thank you ashley connor whose new series is night sky on amazon starring sissy sasek and jk simmons Ashley, uh, this is a show that blends a lot of different genres. I feel like family drama, mystery, road movie, uh, science fiction, obviously. What were the initial discussions about or what was your initial approach to how this could look? Because I feel like it could have gone a lot of different ways. And, and I think the way it looks is beautiful. But like, what, were your approach, what was your approach, basically? I think for me, um, you know, I'm not a heavy sci-fi person. I would, I'm what I would call soft sci-fi. Um, so the, when I was sent the scripts, I really attached myself more to the story of the couple of Irene and Franklin and um, sort of this couple towards the end of their lives, sort of reckoning with um, death and what it means to have like lived their full lives. And for me, uh, that was like the heart of the story. And it was about balancing the more fun adventures. You know, we spoke a lot about Spielberg and sort of how to, how Spielberg kind of effectively imbues so much intimacy into a science fiction. And so we really wanted to center it around, especially Sissy's experience, because it's kind of Irene's story. Um, so a lot of the visual talks were sort of a more meets Spielberg and what that like unholy marriage of like <laughs> wouldn't uh, entail. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, that's what attracted me. I mean, that's awesome. The more meets Spielberg is not something I would have, I, even though I like, I was like, oh, that's once you said it, it's like, oh yes, but that it, it is really an interesting marriage. I feel like not, not, it's completely unexpected, I guess also, um, you know, you, I know, I think you did five of the eight episodes and cinematographer when you're like setting the visual like look and i mean how do you work and make sure it stays consistent across the whole series then in that capacity and like make sure you're everybody's like getting that a more meat spielberg vibe basically you know i think uh we were pilot to series uh so you're sort of building the look of the show not necessarily on the fly but you're trying to internalize the structure and how it looks and sort of process very quickly um, so a lot of, you know, I did the first two and then, uh, Drew Weed came in for the third episode. So a lot of it was sort of establishing what our baseline, we talked a lot about the celestial nature, you know, our show brings you to space. So we really wanted the moon to have a strong presence. And so it was kind of a balancing act of how we made these, uh, more natural elements play and a role in the storytelling. Um, the lighting of the set, you know, the whole interior of the house is a set beautifully built by production designer Scott Cusio. Um, and I had a lot of windows. So a lot of the light, you know, the, the sort of approach was use big, hard light <laughs> to kind of speak through the windows and then minimal, minimal uh, gear on the ground. But it was just sort of um, setting the team up right and making sure everyone was on the same page about the approach to what I'm not a huge night lighter usually. I'm not a huge moon person. So it was kind of fun to speak that language and you know do large tubes of death and uh, just kind of let myself be more playful um, than I typically am. Um, 
Yeah. You have like mentioned this show is kind of from Irene's perspective, obviously you have Sissy Spacek is an incredible performer. J.K. Simmons is incredible. I, I found their work in this so effortless almost, and it just is so natural. And I guess, can you talk about, you know, working with them on those performances and like how you kind of approach like them, obviously they're Oscar winning actors. So I'm sure they know what they're doing on, on the face of it, but I do feel like this is like really remarkable stuff they're pulling off on this show. So I like, I'd love to hear you talk about that. Well, I think for me, we really didn't want the science fiction element to overwhelm their story. Like if you didn't love them and root for their relationship, then I felt like the show wouldn't work. So it was really about letting them perform. They're so talented. It was, you know, a master class in acting every day. And, you know, I felt so lucky to be there for, you know, certain scenes and to just kind of watch their process. You know, you, I sort of want to not inhibit their performance as much as possible. And that's sort of why my approach to lighting is more light the space, not the face and let them have the ability to move, have the ability to, uh, block as they want to, I guess. Um, and for me, yeah, it was, you don't have to do much with them. I mean, you can really just let them perform. And that to me was so exciting to not kind of interfere with them and, or get in their way or be distracting. I didn't want the camera work to be distracting from the sort of heart and needing to, uh, connect with these people. Right. You have the other, you mentioned like the show does bounce around in time a little bit, I guess we could say like, yeah, and I found that really compelling too, because there's no like blaring, like this is a flashback, but obviously you could tell, like the audience is able to keep up very well. And I, I think that visually, I found that really interesting. I can, you, do you guys talk about those scenes like differently and how they would look like you know, when you're seeing like, you know, the younger, when they're younger and stuff, and even, you know, when they're I guess 20 years earlier with, with their son and stuff, those scenes, like how did you guys talk about those scenes and how they would look? I think, you know, the idea, I'm not necessarily somebody who's going to put it like a sepia tone to uh, let the audience know that we're flashing back. Um, so the conversation kind of stemmed with Scott, the production designer to, and the costume designer to really, it's almost like the colors fade a little bit. We didn't want it to be, hit over the head, but it's like in the flashbacks, colors are a bit more vibrant, their clothes seem newer, and then present day, it's just more worn in. And that was sort of the approach was like, how do we kind of amp up and turn, you know, make the lights a little bit peakier, uh, blow them out a little bit more and kind of let it be dreamy without too much effect on top. Yeah, it's really cool. I was reading, I think there, I think you have this on your Instagram, but there's a nylon article about you and it says, I thought this line was really great. It says, you're adept at capturing unapologetically strong performers, particularly leading women in often intimate, confrontational and vulnerable environments that never veers into sensationalism. And I found that really true in this, but I guess, how do you basically like, like, how do you do that? I think that's like really like, it's very well written there, but I was like, it's very impressive. So how do you accomplish that? Something like that? Well, I think, you know, it's just an approach. To me, it's an approach to working with people, to collaborating with actors, to how you approach them. And I think for me, you know, as we move beyond gender, as we like move beyond these sort of traditional means of communicating, like the male gaze, the female gaze, you know, I don't really subscribe to those things, but for me, it is in conversation with cinematic history and it is in conversation with, I think how women have in these kinds of roles have typically been presented and something that's inherent to my process, inherent to my work is sort of a renegotiation of those terms. So that's very abstract, um, <laughs> you know, how you do it, you know, yeah. I just kind of do it. And it's sort of just a general approach to, I don't know, framing women. And that's something that's always been a focus of my work is, you know, telling stories that interest me in ways that hopefully round out how women have been visualized. And I think the character of Irene was somebody I really uh, connected with. I think especially after 2020 and lockdown and you know this sort of question about loneliness that we all have and connection and human connection. And to me, I really wanted to explore what it means to be lonely in a relationship, what it means to be lonely in your life. And I think that that's something that we all felt very acutely 
even being at home with loved ones. It's just, you know, a very unique time to be making the show about loneliness. Yeah, it, and it's it's a really it's a very 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 cool show, and I'm, I'm very compelling. It's last thing before over. Like, what was like for you the biggest surprise, or that you were like un, something unexpected on the show that you were, or you know, that you were like, oh, I didn't like even no matter how much prep you did, you could not anticipate, and then end up like paying off really well. I think the without giving away anything, you know, I'm not really a heavy VFX person and traditionally have not done heavy VFX. Um, and so that was a definite learning curve, but to kind of solve that and uh, find ways of incorporating realistic elements into the visual effects, because I think traditionally sometimes we're taught what the cheapest route is as opposed to what visually looks the best. And so sort of finding a way through the visual effects to kind of push um, a sense of naturalism into them that didn't interfere with comps, but uh, could help benefit so that it felt more integrated and not so VFX heavy. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a great show. Night Sky uh, streaming on Amazon. A Ashley Connor, thank you so much for doing this. Thank Appreciate you. it. Phil Blanion, cinematographer for Star Trek Discovery season four, is now streaming on Paramount Plus. I, I know you worked as a cinematographer, Phil, on numerous episodes of Picard, actually, before embarking on season four of Discovery. So, how did you dis how did you like go about differentiating the looks of the show while keeping within the obviously the the milieu of Star Trek and the universe of Star Trek? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, they're, they're quite different shows. I actually did Discovery before Picard. And then the first season of Picard. So I have a little bit of um, knowledge about, you know, how the two shows were going to kind of be. Um, Picard's very much a kind of a character piece about the man. And uh, Discovery is more about um, more larger scale kind of humanistic stories, this adventurer and, and, and Discovery. Um, so, yeah, I felt like right away they were very different. They were different pieces. Um, uh, we tended to shoot less cameras on, on Picard, um, a little more single camera coverage and on Discovery, you know, we have, uh, you know, three, sometimes four cameras on set, um, to cover, you know, seven, eight, nine people in the scene sometimes. So. Yeah. You meant, I know you mentioned, I, I knew you worked on Discovery before. So coming back for season four, I guess, how much did the show, had the show changed or do you feel like, or like what was like new coming back into it after, you know, after being away? Yeah, I mean, the whole timeline changed. It was quite a different show. Uh, Discovery actually jumps a thousand years in the future um, since season two. So, you know, um, the whole methodology to the technology changed. You know, we don't do wires or plumbing or, 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 or things like that anymore. And, you know, our furniture floats and, um, you know, just trying to imagine this tech, you know, a thousand years in the future. What, is, what does lighting look like? You know, like, how do we use lighting? Um, how does it change? Yeah. So all those kind of questions. Uh, and then when you're up. doing that, like, how do you, I guess, like, how do you answer those questions? Cause they're all, I mean, it's like, it is fascinating and like, it does look so different and really cool. And you're obviously blending, you know, like a lot of visual effects and, you know, prosthetic makeup and all these different things. How do you like make sure you approach it? So it feels like real, I guess it's weird to say realistic to somebody watching it, but like I watch, when you watch a show, you're like, this is, seems like it could be what it's like, right. Or whatever. So how do you, get that approach visually and or get that to 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 hit the mark visually yeah and and also you know it's you can kind of go high tech and think okay what's even more technologically advanced what's more but often it's like what's less you know like what would humans keep you know what what is inherent you know would people still gravitate towards a, a campfire or um to parties or to communicating in person so, um, and that, it's a lot of those analog things that the audience, I think, will still connect with. So um, a lot of it's about, you know, maintaining older kind of natural kind of vibe. Um, and then, you know, for instance, you know, you, you might have a, a light that floats in space, you know, but it, it would still be something kind of natural and organic, you know um in color temperature say or in quality you know so 
Mm-hmm. Is this a lot of for you? Is it like a lot of trial and error to find how it would look, or how do you like it? You know, how do you research it to make sure? Like, are you just is it like you're walking around your house and being like, oh, that that kind of looks cool? You know what I mean? Like, is it stuff like that? Like, what is like what is the process? <laughs> yeah. Like? yeah, there's a lot of three a.m. kind of like, oh yeah, that would kind of work. Um, yeah, and uh, you know, just looking at references, looking at what you like, what what you respond to, you know, um, and you know, a lot of it's conversing with, you know, uh, the wonderful talent we have on the show too, the production designer, the director, we're, we're kind of banging ideas off of each other and coming up with, uh, you know, how would this look? The show, like talking about the visuals, it has all these great performances as well. Like you said, like a much bigger, big cast and all these different, how do you make sure you're not losing those, that humanity, I guess, uh, from the, of the performances within the visuals, you know what I mean? Like, and like within the scope of when you have like these, you know, a lot of massive visual effects, like I said, like all these different things, because the performances are so like, I mean, for lack of a better word, like human, I, I, you know, it's like, it is, it comes across really well and you're able to get those intimate moments within the big, you know, spectacle, I think. And how do you get, how do you, how are you able to accomplish that? Yeah, I think you just really trust in the writing, you know, I, I think, um, you know, we have an incredible team that um, that knows all the canon, knows all the history, um, knows good writing, and then those scripts come down to us and we all respond to it and, and the actors are so well versed at um, breathing life into these characters. Um, you kind of it's more about standing back and and just giving giving them that space or creating an atmosphere on set that they can kind of shine you know so um you're pre-lighting you're you're trying to make it look as good as possible without making a big fuss about it you know and and giving them the space to do their thing yeah there were a, a, a lot of surprises on the season of discovery one i will i not necessarily i guess it's a spoiler but the finale had a big cameo with uh Stacey Abrams shows up. I was, I, um, not, I don't think that's a spoiler because it was like an actual news story. So, uh, I, what was that like? I, I know she's obviously a big Trek fan, but can you talk about that that sequence? I just that was such a, it was a very fun treat. I think for for fans and for viewers, I guess. What was that like to do that? And what was it like, I guess, just like is that one of those days where you're like, wow, I can't believe I'm just shooting Stacey Abrams in a, a Star Trek <laughs> Discovery episode. It just seems like not something you would necessarily expect, but I, I thought it was really cool. Yeah, yeah, it was a very surreal day. It was, uh, I think it was our last day of, of season four, we shot it. Um, and uh, it was on our virtual production stage that was all very um, sort of, you know, expectations were high and, but it was also kind of a joyous atmosphere. Um, so it was exciting. That, that's all I kind of got to yeah. say about it. It was very exciting. And uh, yeah, it, it was what a great was day. Yeah, what was I mean for you? What was the a the, the a shot that you were so excited, like you were excited to get, or just like you were like, oh, this like could be really complicated. I'm really thrilled that we were able to pull it off in this last season. Mm. In the season, yeah, uh, you know, we kind of go into this orb um, of the ten C. They, they kind of envelop the the ship in this orb, and. Uh, our directing producer asked me, look, is there something we can do practically in these windows instead of green screen? And at first I thought, oh, you know, like, you know, we're not gonna see any scope or scale or anything. And so I, I kind of built, started playing with some mylar and some plastic and just different light. Me and the key grip just went and bounced light around and found this kind of like material that could I, I could get this shimmer. And what I realized was when I put this this orb light in front is all of a sudden I had windows again. I had window light coming in all the ships, which in, when you're in space, it's not usually happening. Sometimes you're bringing in sun and stuff, but this beautiful soft window light. So we were able to capture you know, a lot of the end episodes with natural light and you got all the real reflections off the furniture and cast and everything. And so I was pretty proud of that. Yeah, that's awesome. And I guess like you, I'm obviously like you have a, a deep history here with Star Trek, like you mentioned, like Picard and Discovery and stuff. Why do you? I mean, what the show is incredibly vital still. Obviously, like Strange New Worlds just premiered. Like it's like you know people are still very excited about Star Trek. Obviously, it still has a lot to say. But what like what do you think is like the what is so la- like why is it so lasting in culture and why do people keep coming back to Star Trek and finding you know new audiences are finding it? Like I said, and just beyond like obviously you know fans who have been fans for 40, 50 years. 
I, I think, I mean, I'll speak for myself. I think, um, you know, it's our positive view of the future, you know, like a, a, there's a lot of stories out there that are dismal and, and, and negative and portray an apocalyptic future for humankind and Star Trek kind of says, look, here's a path forward. Like we can, we can get along and we can communicate and we can, we can explore and discover. And so I think uh, the fans appreciate that as well. I think. Has your perspective on the show changed having worked on it at all? Like even from like what going in, like I'm sure you were obviously like a fan or at least aware of Star Trek before you started working on it. Cause it's, you know, major franchise, but I mean, has your perspective on it changed? um yeah um changed no i think um it's it's flourished like i've obviously been into delve into you know three years of star trek canon and watching old episodes and and tng and 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 really diving into you know how a star trek episode is formed and 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 what makes a great episode and you know so uh i think it's just fleshed out a lot yeah. What what do we do? But I think the core beliefs has, has always been the same. Yeah. You don't have to tell you don't have to go away trade secret. What does make a great episode in your opinion of Star Trek? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. It's just, you know, it's just when when it hits everything hits together, you know, you, you just have you have the right um story at the right time, the actors are in the right place, you have um I don't know, just uh, everything starts banging on all cylinders. The director brings uh, that certain something, that that bit of magic, that bit of life, and um, and everything connects. Um, yeah, they can be, some of the simpler episodes are, you know, have much larger um, sort of ideas about them and, and they just work, you know, even even if sometimes the you know, traditionally, if the effects have been poor or something like that, I and mean, talking the older episodes, you know, um, the original series and stuff, you just buy in because the concepts are so great. Yeah. Uh, Phil Blanion, Star Trek Discovery Cinematographer, season four, streaming on Paramount Plus. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. Toby Robitaille, cinematographer for Under the Banner of Heaven on FX and streaming on Hulu. Uh, I, I read an article, Dustin Lance Black, the creator, he said he spent 10 years working on this adaptation, obviously very close to the material. I, I would like, what kind of input did he have or did like from a visual standpoint, you know, and like, you know, what were your conversations with him like initially about the show, I guess? Uh, I mean, Lance is obviously, you know, he's, he knows that story. He, he, he was at some point in his life and is you involved in the Mormon community and at some point he yeah he was just interested in telling that story and and it's you know he it's so he was there from day well for 10 years but he was so involved and so conscious about every single detail and yeah it was it was really it was great working with him because he was always there feeling or knowing if we were going in the good direction like like he knew that you know people were gonna watch that show and maybe try to find uh, flaws into the way we were telling that story so he was really precise and yeah like a good yeah yeah do you, when you're obviously like you mentioned, like this is a very specific community, Mormon community, and you know, yeah. fact-based show. When before you start, do you like are you part, are you doing like a lot of research? Like where do you like how are you how do you approach it before even like beyond the, just the scripts and stuff? Like how are you like when, with with a project like this? Yeah, well, I have to say there that uh, I didn't sh like um, I didn't shoot the the pilot, so I had to catch the ball, uh, you know. Gonzalo Amat and David McKenzie, well, with uh, Lance, they established a look for the show. And then, you know, it was a premiere for me having to <laughs> follow into something. But it, it's, you know, I, I read the script and I reacted to it in a way that I felt it's, it's a true story. And we had to find a way to stay true to the story and and yeah make it look real 
Uh, and I think that's what we tried to, and we did. I, I, I think we, <laughs> we did uh, make it look real and, and, and true to the story. So I, I think I reacted to this. Um, yeah. I'm sorry. Yes. No, that's great. I mean, yeah, yeah, I know yeah. you picked up, I, I think your first episode is episode three, yeah. I believe, right? Because you didn't do the first. Really three and saying. four. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a show beyond being like a mystery and a procedural, obviously. It's about a man having his faith and his beliefs challenged, right? Like I think at its core, and you see yeah. that with, with uh, Andrew's character, uh, I guess like visually, like how do you, how do you tell that? Like it's a, such an, in, it's an internal struggle on him, but you're obviously doing this visual, it's a visual medium. So how do you tell that story? And like, how do you like kind of, make sure you're getting across that the torment or the internal struggle that he's facing. Sure. I think, I think the main idea for me was to stay with him. It's, it's his POV. I mean, it's his vision. It's his quest to this, you know, and it's this, this man struggling with his own faith. And, and um, yeah, if, if there's something that I did there is, it, it it was like yeah to, to to keep with them or to keep with like trying to put an image the way he was discovering everything and he was dealing with it so it means <clears throat> put the camera really close to him sometime and uh, he, he, yeah obviously we were shooting with many cameras so sometimes you gotta work on long longer lenses but but my goal was my like my feeling was to, to to put the camera as close as I could to it. Yeah. yeah. And I think it worked because, because that's the way we feel it's true. We're, we're there with him. We're discovering at the same time, not before, you know, it's, yeah. Yeah. What would, I mean, obviously you have this incredible actor, Andrew Garfield and Oscar nominee this year. He's like an incredible, he's like, obviously yeah. an Emmy contender this year for this show. I, working with him, I guess, you know, what like what was that like? And I, maybe even more so, like what surprised you about him and his commitment to the part? <clears throat> you know, I come from the indie world. It was a first time for me doing American television, and um, not that I haven't worked with great actors, but these actors are just like incredibly good at what they're doing, and at like, and and something that I must say is the way thing things were established. Uh, is we wanted to give the actors room like like room to play so it was not um technically for me it meant uh yeah, for sure we were doing blockings but really basic ones like like it's almost as we were just talking about the scenes maybe no positions for the actors and then and then that was it uh, we had time to work and light maybe I, I think I, 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 yeah, the way to do this uh, was for me to light the, 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 the sets rather than the actors. And, and then we kind of let them play, as Lance said uh, many times, um, we kind of let them play. And then you have, you know, great actors, Andrew Garfield, and you understand why you're doing that. It's, it's like, it, it, it's just happening. Sometimes I was, you know, it's big sets, great actors, you're into like the technical thing and then you just pause for a second and it's like, wow, like this is just amazing. They're so good. And there's like the, 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 way, the way he could or they could, you know, just feel it. And with no rehearsal sometimes, it was just like, here's what we're gonna do. And that's it, boom, mm -hmm. roll camera. So, Amazing. Yeah. You yeah, gotta but, be rich. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to talk to you too about uh, this is another big difference, I think, in the show or, uh, you know, from from other procedurals or murder mysteries or whatever you want to call it. Uh, Brenda, obviously, the victim is a major force in the storytelling. You have a lot of scenes with her in, in flashback. Daisy Edgar Jones' character. Yep. Uh, how did you approach those scenes? Obviously, like you said, the show's from, from Andrew's POV, but I feel like those scenes with Brenda are really compelling and like the performance is great, obviously. But I guess, how did you approach that? visually and what you wanted to tell there no you're right i mean <clears throat> it's it's uh Pyrie's pov or or it's his story but it's 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 brenda's too and there's this part of the story that um we i mean i'm not gonna say we don't see that much of that but it's always glimpses you know 
and they're very powerful and i think it's it's a i don't know what i can say right now because yeah we don't, don't have to spoil i don't right, want to say right, too right. much but it, it, she was uh, involved in um, can i say that like graphic scenes like the way it was done and and it it's it's like she becomes more like a um not a dream but a remembering of something so i i think at some point <clears throat> when we get into like the episodes it's she, she, her character becomes more yeah like a presence there and and yeah i, I but I, i remember that we decided early not to shoot these flashbacks in a different way than we were doing the whole thing again in order to make it look grounded and real and you know we could have i guess done differently but it was the um, it was the main idea and just to go from from like to treat this whole story as a one and like a, as a as a whole you mentioned how this is like your first major like us television production stuff what like what i guess what was the surprise like working on something of this scale basically for you hmm. <laughs> I would say that yeah I'm not going to lie day one it's I'm looking at that call sheet and there's like hundreds of people there and I'm well like okay and then and then you just go and 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 the the moment you just say okay roll camera then then you you realize it's it's the same thing I mean it's 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 the same thing it's just a different scale and and Well, I don't know. I might be wrong, but that's the way I <laughs> I imagined it and and I kind of like it because it now it becomes you, you know, you're thinking about those great films and series and it's it, it, it not that it's it's losing like some sort of mystery, but it's it's it yeah, you just realize we're we're all doing the same things even if they, like you have one actor and like a, a super small crew or you have this like the tools the tools are the tools you know and at some point we had like i'm not going to say everything but almost everything we could have wished for and we realized that the best tool we had was handheld camera and so you know it's 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 big it's different but it's the same thing i guess yeah. we're just yeah. there to tell a story and when the script is good actors are good It's great then. Yeah. And the show is awesome. To Toby Robitaille, uh, Under a Banner of Heaven, FX series streaming on Hulu. Thank you so much. Welcome. Brenda McGinty, uh, cinematographer on Welcome to Earth, Nat Geo series. It's just an incredible uh, show. I, the visuals on this constantly <laughs> blew me away. I think I read it took more than three years to make. Where did you start in the preparation process? Like where do you even begin with something like this? Yeah, it, it was a, a huge journey. It began... Yeah, at least, well, three years ago, we began to shoot and we were shooting throughout COVID, throughout lockdown. But we were in pre-production six months to a year before that, shooting sort of camera tests, trying to refine an approach, uh, you know, working quite closely in the UK with the showrunner Grand Booth and in the States with Darren Aronofsky. Um, so, yeah, it was very much, we, we all knew each other from One Strange Rock, which was something that I'd worked on. But there was a real shift with Welcome to Earth in that they wanted to immerse their host, Will Smith, in these landscapes. Uh, so it was a very radical proposal, really, to take sort of a Hollywood A-list actor and then, you know, put them on a volcano at the bottom of the ocean, glaciers, you know, all these places. Um, and we wanted a photographic style. There, there, was, there was a huge ask of me to develop a photographic style that would accommodate this new sort of immersion of will. And so how did you go, go about doing that? Because it is remarkable, but I'd love you to talk about it. <laughs> um, I mean, it's, uh, they, uh, there's a couple of things going on. So the, for the documentary uh, sort of vignettes within the series, and I, I shot a fair few of those as well, those were shot Super 35, um, but we decided... Um, that for the sections with Will, we wanted to shoot uh, full frame. So we were shooting sort of Vista Vision. Uh, so that, you know, visually gave us, you know, some of your uh, 
people you've interviewed so far have alluded to the kind of intimacy that gave us combined with it's that mixture of trying to capture the large sort of landscape, this big canvas of the world in all its kind of glory, but but at the same time retain the intimacy. Uh, so we knew we we wanted these huge set pieces with, you know, we were running multiple operators on on you know up to sort of seven operators in some of the set pieces where we we'd go from gimbal to gimbal to steady cam to handheld to long lenses shooting onto things as well. Um, but at the end of the day, we always knew, you know, true to my sort of documentary roots, that I, I would be handheld with Will. Uh, so it, it was trying to find that, that note of, so one of the things I was trying to capture was continuous action as much as possible. Um, they wanted to try, everything was completely unscripted, and we'd, we'd almost block through an area, if you like, and we'd have sort of a a journey, say, uh, will going up a volcano, getting to the top, looking in, seeing the magma, you know, going down to the edge of an active volcano. And we'd block it through sort of days before, uh, you, know, you know, to decide how we would move camera equipment. But then on the day, of course, being a documentary, being sort of human beings and responding to very real situations, uh, you know, you have to be handheld. You have to be on the shoulder with someone experiencing it at the same time as them, not being in front of them. So, yeah. Yeah. Do you have, like, mention, I mean, it sounds like this is just a matter of incredible preparation, but when I was watching, I was like, wow, obviously this is all stuff happening in real time and you're getting these incredible shots. And if you, you just can't miss anything, right. There's no room for error, I guess. And so how do you like, is that just like, like you said, like making, like for lack of a better word, like rehearsing it and making sure it's all like prepped out or like, how do you, how do you account for like not missing the great moments? Uh, I have to say the team that we had were, you know, absolutely world class. Everyone was, um, you know, people from a sort of documentary background. Uh, they, I mean, not in, entirely, you know, I, I shoot sort of commercials and drama as well. And I think they very much wanted me because of that understanding that aesthetic of being a DP running a team of, you know, a very big team actually, and, and pre-production and all of these kind of, um, the way of working where you've got full control of the world but then at the end of the day you know I've shot tons of documentaries where it's just me with the camera on my shoulder and stuff's happening incredibly fast so I suppose it's about team it's having people around you who are very very responsive be very calm very unflappable um, and yeah I, I think you know it was something that uh, that Toby just said at the end of the day you realize the greatest tool you have is being handheld um, that really resonated because you know we had all the toys imaginable you know gimbals and gyro stabilized heads and you know multiple drones and you, you've got all this kind of arsenal of photographic equipment but the amount of scenes that just ended up with you know uh, a camera up i would always operate a camera as well and i was always on will um but it would end up with me and a b camera operating sort of cross shooting two people in these pretty wild scenarios um yeah, and you, it's interesting. You always come back to that, you know, two people talking in the midst of all this stuff and, you know, stuff you've been shooting your whole life. You, you always come back to that. You have like, I mean, like watching it, it just, again, like the uh, visuals, I, you can't even believe that they're they're real almost, right? It's like so incredible. Like for you guys, or for you, was there like, was there one moment where you're just like, wow, I can't like, what was like, I guess, what was there one where you were like, wow, what is like, what a surprise. I can't believe I'm shooting this right now or anything like that. Like, I mean, what was like the, the standout or the headliner for you? To be honest, the, the entire series was, was an amazing journey for me. Uh, I mean, I've been super fortunate. I've, my career has taken me to all these really beautiful, exotic places. And something that I always say to my, say my drama colleagues is, there's something so magical about going to, I don't know, the Amazon rainforest, the way the light breaks through trees and you've got green bounce off the leaves, um, or, you know, shooting in the Arctic where you've got sort of perpetual low daylight and this bounce of the ice. There's something about the natural world and the kind of gift of the light and the textures and that, which is really hard to get back to if, you, if you're trying to orchestrate everything from scratch. So photographically it, it's it's a gift I and mean, the amount of times i would get up to the top of a glacier and i just i can't believe it you know i can't believe what i'm looking at how beautiful everything looks the volcano really stands out um 
what I didn't expect, apart from the incredible danger of shooting up there, was uh, the way the light broke through all of the gases, which were actually very, very toxic gases. So we're all wearing special breathing apparatus and stuff. But the light was sort of pinks and blues and yellows and all these really, this really unexpected palette. And then fire, you know, the magma itself creating this red glow. And it would become quite dark with all the gases. So you'd be lit by this magma as well. It was extraordinary. I mean, I'm not sure you could ever get to it with lighting. Um, so yeah, it, a lot of times it was that. It's just the the kind of gift of the natural world in uh, shooting at the right time of day in the right conditions. And, you know, very hard to sort of get back to that when you try to set a look, you know, so sometimes you're in these places and they, they present to you tremendous beauty, just, you know, it's just there happening. And then, and something like this, and obviously like you said, you have like a lot of experience doing this, like one strange rock as well. Like what is something, I guess that is, is there like a, a misconception that somebody might have watching this or like that they're not like they're not understanding you ever run into that or like what is something that maybe people would be like surprised by that you know or they don't understand um, i do know i remember in pre-production something that you mentioned a, a while ago is they found with with um with one strange rock when they showed it to audiences uh they were testing the series before they put it out and a lot of people couldn't believe the photography and thought they were looking at cg stuff so i think <laughs> You know, which you know felt great, but equally you felt sort of cheated that people didn't realize the kind of great labors you'd gone to to shoot some of this stuff. Um, I suppose it's, you know, a lot of people look at some of the bigger set pieces we do and they imagine, particularly since we have a sort of Hollywood, you know, A-list Hollywood person in the frame, they imagine that we've orchestrated and scripted and blocked and everything. And we haven't. We There's tons of preparation, but we have let the situation go absolutely wild. So it, it is, I think that's probably the, you know, if there's a misconception, it's that, that, that we may be, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of fiction involved. And there isn't. I mean, we really are uh, we would shoot very, very fast uh, in a day, sometimes, sometimes a couple of days in these very exotic, beautiful locations where a lot of action is happening and things typically were pretty dangerous most of the time. And we are just following it uh, in a way. We, our balancing act there was we're trying to, we, we had this sort of, this tremendous sort of cinematographic aspiration. You know, we've got to, Darren Aronofsky directing on the ground and he wants a certain look and feel. He, you know, he's, he's, he's built a career on a very strong sort of visual aesthetic. So you've got all this, this, this kind of, uh, you, you want it to look like something you might see in the cinema and be blown away by, but equally you, you, you're in service of the real world and reality and things, you know, the wildebeest migration crossing the river, that happens incredibly fast. And even to sign up there with, with will and migration was, you know, your heart's in your mouth. I mean, it's, it's happening very, very fast. So, yeah, I think it's that. that a lot of people imagine that they're looking at very orchestrated stuff, but, but they're not. Right. I guess that is the, maybe that's a compliment too, right? Because it's like, oh, wow, this is, it's so great and so, so pre precision that it must be not real, real, but it actually is, which makes it so much better. I, I, Brenda McGinty, the show is, is incredible. Welcome to Earth. Uh, streaming all in that geo show but streaming all on disney plus at the moment thank you so much i appreciate it thank you david robert jones cinematographer on the wonder years uh, a reboot of the original series on abc uh obviously the original was beloved in its time uh david when you were brought on to collaborate on the reboot or reimagining uh, what did you know did you go back to the original episode to see how it looked like where'd you start i guess yeah definitely i definitely did i went back and uh and uh, I was, you know, I, I, uh, I was sent the script, Fred sent me the script and, and then I was like, I don't know. I mean, should we be remaking this? And then I, I read the script and I was like, oh, this is, a, this is amazing. This is so good that, that a, a script that Sal, Saladin Patterson wrote. And I was like, oh, this is a totally different thing and its own story. And, and I was instantly all in. And then in fact, when we talked about it, um, really, uh, the look and intention going in, everything was sort of, it was connected to this new family story and, and this new family uh, was very connected to Saladin's own um, experience in Montgomery, Alabama, growing up in the 60s and, and, uh, and 
and his family and and so um uh so we kind of you know a lot, a lot of it was based on you know we shared images and and pictures of the time but you know it, it was in it was actually difficult to find images of African American families in the 60s in in uh you know in this sort of everyday setting uh, uh and so it was you know there wasn't a lot as much to go off of hmm. as um as you might as I might have hoped but uh but uh, I mean, it was, you know, it was a blast trying to recreate a nostalgic feeling uh, family environment. And we wanted it to feel uh, like a, 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 you know, a real family and, you know, and, 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 and kind of the litmus test for, for every scene or setting, you know, could run through Sal and his stamp of, you know, stamp of approval on like, oh yeah, this, yeah, this, this feels right. And, and uh, and in fact, there were people, other people on set, was like, "Oh man, this is exactly how it was in my family." Like, you know, it, you know, it was it was so satisfying to get those reactions too. Was you know, when we do a scene, and they're like, "Oh man, that's what my mom used to say all the time." And so that was that was a blast. Yeah. When you're trying to recreate, like, it's so I guess ephemeral, but like when you're trying to recreate a nostalgia feeling, like, how do you try to do that visually without like being like. We're just gonna make it look like sepia tone, you know, whatever it is, like kind of like know, kind of cheesy, it's, it's you know hard. what I mean? I mean? Like, how do you do it? Yeah, it's, it's. I mean, there's always a classic way to go back, uh, and you know, and capture those. You know, it's it's in everybody's head. It's a subjective thing. It's um, you know, maybe you're basing it off of other movies you've seen. <laughs> you're just a hell of tone. I didn't live in the '60s, but I've seen a million photos, and you know, and and I and it's actually an aesthetic and. And time period that's really fun from from for me to attempt to recreate and you know from old pictures and things so we did look at old pictures and um and try and capture some of that stuff and and uh and and then approaching it just from a technical standpoint um uh i i got some really you know old lenses old glass from panavision and which were extremely challenging to work with um, we used the uh, H series uh, lenses. We shot large format on Venice, and uh, and uh, pr almost none of the lenses matched each other. Um, so uh, and then, but it was awesome because each lens had its own flavor. We were like, oh man, let's you know, this this fifty is great. We'll use this fifty for this shot, and then this fifty five over here we'll use for you know this other angle, and then. Uh, and there were certain there was a couple lenses which I was you know every time I put on I was like oh this is it this is the show this is the magic we had a 20 millimeter lens that was the greatest thing I was like every time I put on it looked like a painting and I was but you can't use a I mean unless it's the the voice of your show we couldn't use a 20 millimeter for um every shot uh, unfortunately next show um <laughs> but uh um but uh, yeah, so there was, you know, so we tried to rough it up a little bit and I, I really played with underexposing the image a lot. Um, I, I did a very fast test uh, early on, right before we shot and created a lot with um, my uh, colorist, uh, Matt Osborne and, and, um, and try, you know, try to dial in some, some looks and, and, uh, and just make it feel real, but kind of lived in and, you know, we didn't really have any true whites or true blacks uh, in the show, and and which I thought felt right. And mm -hmm. um, and then and then lighting wise, approaching it lighting wise, we you know I I attempted to light you know especially day spaces from outside as much as possible. I worked with Andrea, the production designer, uh, ahead of time on the stage set to to try and put windows in the right places. And 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 in fact, we shot at a location for the pilot, which was a practical location, but then we went to the stage. Uh, I, was, I was really pushing, I was really pushing to have our, our rooms, the actual sizes and, and, you know, and we were all constantly like, I was like, let's make it tinier, let's make it smaller. And she's like, I don't know, maybe, we, you know, I'm sure you don't want some more space. And then, and then uh, I think um, we ended up making them bigger, but um, which is, which was the right call. Cause we had a lot of cameras in each scene and, and, uh, but uh, but I do like being in the real tiny spaces at times and making it feel real and having to use the wide lenses because we have to and and uh, and and you know 
capturing the reality of a moment. And yeah. Seeing. So obviously the show is twel- told from you know, the perspective of a, a 12 year old a Dean. How did you try to reflect that in his perspective when in, in the shots, if at all? Uh, yeah, that, that was a big part of it. And a big part of what each director would come in uh, knowing and, and, and reading in the script too, is it's right in there. Cause it's, you know, the voiceover is prevalent. And, um, uh, and, and that was the big mandate, you know, uh, Fred and I talked about that a lot. Like let's, what's, what's the perspective of the scene? Like, you know, who's witnessing this and, you know, well, it's always, it's always, um, it was always EJ, the, uh, I mean, um, Dean, the protagonist who was witnessing it, but, but it wasn't always about him. So we had to, you know, uh, decide on how we were going to shoot the scene. Um, but, you know, it's not like we shot from a POV for the whole movie, but we really made sure we saw him, we saw him seeing this. And, you know, if it was something he was objectively seeing, you know, through a doorway, you know, we'd, we'd uh, you know, most likely shoot it that way. Um, you know, see him seeing this through a doorway, shoot it a little longer lens or from afar, you know. So yeah. um, that was something we definitely were thinking about. In the pilot, there's the great scene where uh, the family finds out that Martin Luther King has been assassinated. I, I love that scene because it, it's just not necessarily so matter of fact, but I just think it obviously has such a broader impact on them than they're like, you know, the white neighbors and stuff. And I, I just love, can you talk about like that and like kind of how that scene came together and, and how you guys like thought about that? Because I just found that really compelling. I think that's a great moment in the show. Um, yeah, that was a great scene which we in fact you know like like many of our days shot under extreme time duress and panic you know uh which we had to temper back because of daylight loss and you know and kid time kid time made the whole show uh, uh it was a, it was a new thing cuz the cuz the um you know kids can only work so many hours and uh, and since there was one um you know EJ was in every scene of every episode of the entire TV show, we were really um, pegged to his working time. So that was one of those that we had, uh, that we had thought a lot about. And, and um, um, yeah, I mean, we, again, we wanted to capture the reality of this baseball, you know, this baseball scene happened before and then, uh, and then, and then get in, you know, up the, up the heat between the coach and, and dad, you know, dad and, you know, like, start escalating that into so you know absurdity really you know between two dads you know so we were in a comedic moment so we wanted to build the comedic moment and then uh and then drop into kind of a real moment and and the whole show is like that now you know it's a comedy but it's 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 but we didn't approach it like a comedy we approached it like a drama and it had funny stuff that happens and we wanted uh we wanted every scene and every you know all the actors to play the reality of the moment um, uh, the best they could so that, you know, and the comedy will come through in, in the reality of this family life. And, and that was, you know, how yeah. we approach that scene in every scene. Yeah. And it's a great show. Wonder Years, uh, uh, ABC series. You can stream the episodes on Hulu. David Robert Jones, thank you so much for doing the cinematographer on the Wonder Years. Thanks so much. Carl Walter Linden Laub from Halo. Uh, Ashley Connor from Night Sky, Phil Vlanian from Star Trek Discovery, Toby Robitaille from Under the Banner of Heaven, Brendan McGinty from Welcome to Earth, and David Robert Jones from The Wonder Years, all incredible cinematographers. Thank you so much for doing this. Uh, I wanted to start here just like, when did you uh, all decide that you wanted to be a cinematographer? When did you realize this was something that you could a- actually do? Carl Walter, I'm going to start with you and we'll just go around. Originally, I wanted to become a journalist uh, and then found out that there is a film school in Munich. Uh, in those days in Germany, film school was sort of uh, a thing for freaks. There were two schools in Germany and in and, and the whole film business, people didn't really believe you could study something like filmmaking in, in, in the university environment. Uh, so I did apply and I got into the documentary program, which was closest to journalism. And uh, I was very young. Uh, We all had to direct. I ended up uh, connecting with the feature directors and and doing a lot of films with them together, um, starting to shoot uh, shoot for them. Uh, And then I had to direct my my graduation film, which was a a 50-minute drama. 
And I was so scared and so nervous. I was 23 when I finished and I thought, I'm too young to become a director. I, I'm going to start as a cinematographer. <laughs> it just came naturally to me. I already had shot a lot of student films and it was the, the better way to get started. And somehow I got stuck there. <laughs> I imagine a, a film school was for free and not journalism. What a time it must have been for you. Uh, no, <laughs> actually. Oh, endless discovery, yes. <laughs> and actually, start learning. <laughs> yes. um, yeah, I grew up loving films. I'm from the Valley um, and surrounded by film people. And I think when I went to film school, I just, uh, the assumption was that I would have wanted to direct, but I very quickly realized um, I communicate with an inanimate object potentially better than humans. Uh, and I like the control aspect. And, you know, at film school, I sort of vacillated between studying cinematography and doing kind of traditional storytelling and but my heavier focus was experimental film mm -hmm. uh so i really learned to play on film and how to do in-camera effects and i think that that has greatly influenced my uh cinematography <laughs> and my approach to the image um but yeah i think you know I just grew up loving movies yeah. and why not try to work in them if you can. What was like the first movie you were like, oh, I love this, or this is like something that really had an effect? You know, I think my dad would tell me not to say, but, uh, you know, he let me watch A Clockwork Orange pretty young. <laughs> and uh, I, you know, and then in 2001, and he sort of showed me a few kind of, bigger brained movies that kind of blew my mind in my teen, in my early teens. And I think it was sort of those films, you know, I had sort of, I had seen, you know, easier American movies, um, but those were the films that really kind of engaged my brain in a more photographic sense and really like brought me into a more artier space of mm -hmm. filmmaking. Yeah, good, good choices. That's not bad. Uh, Philip, how about yourself? What was it? What, what about you? What made you want to become a cinematographer here? I mean, I think originally um, my father was a photographer and uh, always had cameras around the house. He was went through photography school and ended up getting hired on the fire department, um, taking photos of arson scenes. Um, so we always had these kind of cameras and his pictures around the house. And then I went to school and didn't want to be a firefighter, <laughs> so, but I wanted to be an actor. And so um, I pursued that as far as I could and then realized that I also needed to be a filmmaker to be an actor and so I ended up getting into making films and and that's when I kind of got opened up to this world of cinematography where you could kind of um, act act through the camera in some ways and and bring bring life to a story that way and so that meld was perfect for me nice that's awesome to Toby how about yourself well, as a teenager, uh, high school, uh, I was going to this uh, high school very, um, we were doing arts a lot, like um, playing music, plays, theater. Um, and there was this dark room. <laughs> uh, my, my dad gave me at some point, like my parents gave me a, a, a Nikon FM2 35 mil camera. And I just like started playing with it. And I hated being or trying to be an actor when we were doing play at school. So I said, like, can I just step back a bit and maybe do something else like the lighting or so I did. I liked that very much. And at some point I told my parents, you know what, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do lighting for plates and theater. <laughs> and I remember this is funny because I still remember that my dad said, like, I mean, you like taking pictures, you like lighting things you know so why don't you think about doing films and i was like yeah yeah you know i i never thought about that and that was it so then i yeah college uh film school and i started uh, doing uh, documentaries i did documentaries for like more than 10 years and yeah that's it yeah that's awesome brendan how about you um, I grew up, both of my parents are stills photographers, and uh, I grew up, we sort of traveled the world. I didn't really have a fixed home for years and years. We, I grew up in sort of 
Angola and the Congo and Afghanistan and all these quite, you know, always surrounded by cameras and photography and, and the world. Um, later on, I started I, I, at university, I studied film, but it was in a very academic way, very impractical. And by then I was shooting loads of stills. So I had lots of technical facility because my parents put me to work at a very young age, like printing contact sheets for them and stuff. But I didn't really realize that there was someone who was a cinematographer, uh, you know, it was all about the director. And I imagined a director sort of did everything. And it was quite a revelation to me when I began to work on say short films and music videos and then I didn't even know the role existed. And I suddenly realized that there was this, the, the cameras, the lenses, the film stocks, all these things that I knew a lot about and that I loved, that this role was, was one I was like perfectly fitted to, but it was kind of accidental. I didn't even know that the role existed until I saw it. Yeah, that's awesome. And, and, and David, how about yourself? Yeah, I kind of feel like I didn't know it existed either. I was uh, out of college. I was I was pre med, and I, you know, was applying to med school, and and then I was living in Chicago, and then and I was like, God, this is not right. Like I, I was working in a in a laboratory, and I was like, I, this is something this is not the right fit. And then, and then my aunt one day, who had been kind of talking about things with, um, you know. Uh, about what am I going to do with my life uh, kind of conversations a lot she's like you know there's a film school here and and uh and you know I like all of you loved movies when I was a kid and that's kind of like was my focus and I you know my my parents loved movies and and uh and so that was sort of something where I could connect a passion to the to a job but I it didn't occur to me like it was a possibility like growing up in the Midwest and, you know, in a family that wasn't connected to all, it didn't occur to me that, oh yeah, right. And all of a sudden it occurred to me like, oh, right, there might be a job I could have that's related to that. And then uh, I got into film school and, and immediately was, I was fired up because, you know, after college, you're like, oh my God, I need a job. I need to do this and that. But I was, I was fired up. So I said like, this is it. I was like, this is, I love this. And I was shooting everybody's project and, you know, I was, I was so into it and so it kind of immediately was uh you know tractor beams for um, yeah filmmaking and cinematography specifically yeah that's awesome and we we do have to wrap up here quickly but i want to just add one more thing like all of you guys are all these projects like you said are very different but they're all i just find incredibly visually appealing and the stuff you're doing and these are incredible what as like what is getting what gets you excited to you know when you get to set like that you're just like oh i can't believe i get to do this kind of thing like what is it like about on the day on a daily basis on these jobs that you are just like thrilled to do because i feel like that passion the passion is in the works so i'm assuming this is an accurate representation of what you guys are experiencing but uh carl walter i'll start with you and then and we could go back around well, well it's very enjoyable for me when i get to work on a project where you do some world building where you actually have to create things that don't exist. That's always exciting or travel to the past and recreate something that's not there anymore. And then it's that human experience. You know, you have a, a group of people that tries to accomplish something to, that can only be done together. And it's, it's incredibly challenging. And very often it's an international place where people come from everywhere together. And uh, that, that ability to make something bigger than yourself, you know, mm -hmm. hopefully for other people to enjoy and, and, and take something with them. That that's an enormous privilege. I would say nobody gets to play with these big toys and <laughs> so much money without a sure outcome. You know, it's always a huge gamble. Who does yeah. that? <laughs> yeah, <it's true. laughs> Ashley, how about you? I just think as cinematographers, we get to work on so many different kinds of stories. We get to tell so many different kinds of stories. We get to meet so many amazing people, work with so many incredible crews. And to me, I think that's when I pinch myself is just the lifestyle and the experience. It's like, I just flew it back from a film festival in Krakow and immediately started a new TV show. <laughs> and, uh, you know, sometimes, yeah, you just kind of have to count your blessings and realize like it's a fun life uh, and a fully lived life and I think that that's what's so exciting about the work we do we change yeah. modes quickly yeah uh, Philip how about you 
don't know if I have those moments on set. <laughs> They're usually more like, ah, what are we going to do? <laughs> They're a little more frantic. But I think I love the dissection of a story, reading a story for the first time and going, connecting with it. And then all of us, you know, hundreds of people dissect this thing into little tiny little pieces. And then we put it all back together and then you watch it at the end of the day. And, and that's my favorite moment when you just... You reconnect with the story and you go, wow, we all did that. That's pretty cool, <laughs> that's pretty cool. Toby. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Uh, it's a, you know, it starts with the with the script. It starts with a good story, and then and then it's how you react to it and how how you 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 want to tell that story and put it in the image. And um, it's. To me, it's really like it's it's basic. It's it's how yeah. It's it's we're so lucky to be able to do this job. It's it's an amazing job, as you said, Carl. Uh, it's who does that, and and um, yeah, being able to read good scripts and and yeah, just go for it. And yeah, yeah. Brendan, how about yourself? I would echo the sentiments of it's the people people uh, who I, th I think for me with my line of work, it's some of the locations I've been taken to are just extraordinary. I'm going to some of the most pristine places in the world to film. But I, I think there's always this moment, which I think maybe we all share, which is you're looking through the viewfinder and it's that moment where you first turn over, where it really feels quite magical. You know you're the sort of first person experiencing this this moment with an actor, with a member of the public, you know, depending on your, your discipline. But it's that moment where there's been all this orchestration and planning and travel and, you know, and finally, just through your viewfinder on whatever lens you run, you're watching the thing happen. That always feels incredibly magical to me, particularly the first, it's normally the first time you turn over where it's really working, that you feel some sort of magic at that. Yeah, and, and David, last but not least. Yeah, I mean, I. I I wouldn't say too much different, except that I think that's an, that initial reading of the script with the director and you were like, ooh, what about this? What about this? What about this idea? Like in your, the banter back and forth, it's so exciting. And then there's like a, uh, you know, the period in between and, and, and you have all these ideas and then you show up on set and you're like, I, you know, like I, I feel like the, the day one on set sometimes is like, I, I don't know. I don't know if any of this works, but I don't know what, I don't know what if any of this will work. And then, and then you do it and you get in the motion and you're just, you know, blood, sweat and tears there. And, and then you get something, you get a take in the can and you're like, oh, wow. And when, when you have that moment of like, wow, that, that was great. That really worked. Like there's nothing more satisfying than, than, uh, than witnessing that, you know, all these people from all walks of life have made this one cohesive uh, image or, or, or scene. And it's, it's really cool. Yeah, it's it, it's great to hear, and it, it all of your work is so great. Just one last time, Carl Walter Linden Lab, cinematographer for Halo, uh, Ashley Connor, cinematographer on Night Sky, Philip Lanyon, cinematographer for Star Trek Discovery, Toby Robitaille, cinematographer for Under the Banner of Heaven, Brendan McGinty, cinematographer for uh, Welcome to Earth, and David Robert Jones, cinematographer for The Wonder Years. All great shows. Thank you all so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you everybody. Right. Thank you,